Part One, Chapter Four of the Gentlemen and Ladies Book of Politeness and Propriety of Deportment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laurie Arsenault. The Gentleman and Ladies' Book of Politeness and Propriety of Deportment by Elizabeth Selnard. Part One, Chapter Four of Propriety as Regards Oneself. Attention to one's person and reputation is also a duty. If vanity, pride, or prudery have frequently given to these attentions the names of coquetry, ambition, or folly, this is a still stronger reason why we should endeavor to clear up these points. Section 1 of the Toilet Propriety requires that we should always be clothed in a cleanly and becoming manner, even in private, in leaving our bed or in the presence of no one. It requires that our clothing be in keeping with our sex, fortune, profession, age, and form, as well as with the season, the different hours of the day, and our different occupations. Let us now descend to the particulars of these general rules. The dress for a man on his first rising is a cap of cotton or silken cotton, a morning gown or a vest with sleeves. For a lady, a small muslin cap, bonnet de pecal, a camisole, or common robe. It is well that a half corset should precede the full corset, which last is used only when one is dressed, for it is bad taste for a lady not to be laced at all. The hair papers, which cannot be removed on rising, because the hair would not keep in curl till evening, should be concealed under a bandeau of lace or of the hair. They should be removed as soon as may be. In this dress we can receive only intimate friends or persons who call upon urgent or indispensable business. Even then we ought to offer some apology for it. To neglect to take off this morning dress as soon as possible is to expose oneself to embarrassments often very painful, and to the appearance of a want of education. Moreover, it is well to impose upon yourself a rule to be dressed at some particular hour, the earliest possible, since occupations will present themselves to hinder your being ready for the day, and you will easily acquire the habit of this. Such disorder of the toilet can be excused when it occurs rarely, or for a short time, as in such cases it seems evidently owing to a temporary embarrassment. But if it occur daily or constantly, if it seems the result of negligence and slovenness, it is unpardonable, particularly in ladies, whose dress seems less designed for clothing than ornament. To suppose that great heat of weather will authorize this disorder of the toilet, and will permit us to go in slippers, or with our legs and arms bare, or to take nonchalant or improper attitudes, is an error of persons of a low class or destitute of education. Even the weather of dog days would not excuse this, and if we would remain thus dressed, we must give directions that we are not at home. On the other hand, to think that cold and rainy weather excuses like liberties is equally an error. You ought not to be in the habit of wearing large socks. This is addressed particularly to ladies, as socks of list and similar materials, much less noisy socks, such as wooden ones, galoshes lined with fur, shoes with wooden soles, socks, etc. This custom is in the worst taste. When you go to see any one, you cannot dispense with taking off your socks or clogs before you are introduced into the room, for to make a noise in walking is entirely at variance with good manners. However pressed one may be, a lady of good breeding should not go out in a morning dress, 
neither with an apron nor cap, even if it is made of fine cloth and trimmed with ribbons. Nor should a well-bred man show himself in the street in a waistcoat only, a jacket without sleeves, etc. We said before that the dress should be adapted to the different hours of the day. Ladies should make morning calls in an elegant and simple negligee, all the details of which we cannot give, on account of their multiplicity and the numerous modification of fashion. We shall only say that ladies generally should make these calls in the dress which they wear at home. Gentlemen may call in an outside coat, in boots and pantaloons, as when they are on their ordinary business. In short, this dress is proper for gentlemen's visits in the middle of the day. With regard to ladies, it is necessary for them when visiting at this time to arrange their toilet with more care. Ceremonious visits, evening visits, and especially balls, require more attention to the dress of gentlemen and a more brilliant costume for ladies. There are for the latter headdresses particularly designed for such occasions, and for no other, such as rich blonde caps, ornamented with flowers, brilliant berets and toques, appropriate to the drawing-room. The nicest cloth, new and very fine linen, an elegant but plain waistcoat, a beautiful watch to which is attached a single costly key, thin and well-polished shoes, an entirely new hat of a superior quality. This is a dress at once ricochet and rigorously exact for gentlemen of good taste and ton. One's profession requires very little modification of this costume. We should observe, however, that men of science, savants, and literary men, and those in the profession of the law, should avoid having a fashionable or military costume, which is generally adopted by students, commercial men, and exquisites for the sake of ton or for want of something to do. Situation in the world determines among ladies those differences which, though otherwise well marked, are becoming less so every day. Every one knows that whatever be the fortune of a young lady, her dress ought always, in form as well as ornaments, to exhibit less of a ricochet appearance, and should be less showy than that of married ladies. Costly cashmeres, very rich furs and diamonds, as well as many other brilliant ornaments, are to be forbidden a young lady, and those who act in defiance of these rational marks of propriety make us believe that they are possessed of an unrestrained love of luxury, and deprive themselves of the pleasure of receiving these ornaments from the hand of the man of their choice. All ladies cannot use indiscriminately the privilege which marriage confers upon them in this respect, and the toilet of those whose fortune is moderate should not pass the bounds of an elegant simplicity. Considerations of a more elevated nature as of good domestic order, the dignity of a wife and the duties of a mother come in support of this law of propriety, for it concerns morality in all its branches. We must beware of a shoal in this case. Frequently a young lady of small fortune, desiring to appear decently in any splendid assembly, makes sacrifices in order to embellish her modest attire. But these sacrifices are necessarily inadequate. A new and brilliant article of dress is placed by the side of a mean or old one. The toilet then wants harmony, which is the soul of elegance as well as of beauty. Moreover, whatever be the opulence which you enjoy, luxury encroaches so much upon it that no riches are able to satisfy its demands. But fortunately, propriety always in accordance with reason, encourages by this maxim social and sensible women. Neither too high nor too low, it is equally ridiculous either to pretend to be the most showy or to display the meanest attire in an assembly. The rules suitable to age resemble those which mediocrity of fortune imposes. 
For instance, old ladies ought to abstain from gaudy colors, ricochet designs, too late fashions, and graceful ornaments as feathers, flowers, and jewels. A lady in decline dressed in her hair, and wearing a dress with short sleeves adorned with collars, bracelets, etc., offends against propriety as much as against her interest in dignity. The rigorous simplicity of the dress of men establishes but very little difference between that of young and old. The latter, however, ought to choose grave colors, not to follow the fashions too closely, to avoid garments too tight or too short and not to have in view in their toilet any other object but ease and neatness. Unless the care of their health or complete baldness requires them to wear a wig, it is more proper that old persons should show their white and noble heads. Old ladies, whose custom requires to conceal this respectable sign of a long life, should at least avoid hair too thick or too full of curls. If they would not appear ridiculous and clothed in a manner disagreeable or offensive, ladies ought to adopt in summer light garments and delicate colors, and in winter furs, thick and warm fabrics and deep colors. Men till lately were almost free from this obligation. They used to be constantly clothed in broadcloth in all seasons. But now, although this may form the basis of their toilet, they must select stuffs for winter or summer as may be suitable. It is in good ton for gentlemen to wear a rich cloak, an outer garment over the coat, especially one of silk, is left for men of a certain age. It only belongs to septuagenarians and ecclesiastics to wear doublets or wadded outer coats. To finish our instructions relative to the toilet, it only remains for us to make a few observations. It is superlatively ridiculous for a lady to go on foot when dressed in her hair or attired for the drawing-room or a ball. If one dwells in a provincial town where it is not customary to use carriages, they should go in a chair. Who does not perceive how laughable it is to see a lady who is clothed in satin lace or velvet laboriously traveling in the dust or mud. Vary your toilet as much as possible, for fear that idlers and malignant wits, who are always a majority in the world, should amuse themselves by making your dress the description of your person. Certain fashionables seek to gain a kind of reputation by the odd choice of their attire, and by their eagerness to seize upon the first caprices of the fashions. Propriety with difficulty tolerates these fancies of a spoiled child, but it applauds a woman of sense and taste who is not in a hurry to follow the fashions and asks how long they will probably last before adopting them. Finally, who selects and modifies them with success according to her size and figure. It would be extremely clownish to carry dirt into a decent house especially if one makes a ceremonious visit, and when there is much mud or when we cannot walk with skill, it is proper to go in a carriage, or at least to put in requisition the services of a shoeblack at a short distance from the house. Section 2 of Reputation Among the cares which propriety obliges us to take of our person, to please is but an accessory circumstance. The principal end is to indicate by cleanliness and the suitableness of apparel that good order, a sense of what is right, and politeness in all things direct our thoughts and actions. In this point of view, we see that a regard to reputation is the necessary consequence of the duties of propriety toward oneself. To inspire esteem and consideration is then the grand object of propriety of conduct, for without this treasure the relations of society would be a humiliation and punishment. They are obtained by the accomplishment of our obligations of family and of our profession, 
by our probity and good manners, by our fortune and situation in society. Consideration is not acquired by words. An article so precious demands a real value. It demands also the assistance of discretion, so that we must begin by fulfilling exactly our duties toward relations, but we must beware of making public those petty quarrels and little differences of interest, of ill-humor or opinion, which sometime trouble families most closely united. These momentary clouds, soon dissipated by affection and confidence, would be engraven on the memory of others as a proof of your domestic discords, and in the end of your faults. Probity, that powerful means of obtaining consideration by its elevated and religious nature, is not within our investigation of the principles of politeness. This is not the case with that consideration which is attached to purity of morals. The proof of probity is in probity itself, but thanks to the delicate shades of reputation, in regard to chastity, there exists, independently of good conduct, a multitude of cares and precautions which, however minute and embarrassing at times, ought never to be neglected. Ladies, to whom the advice contained in this paragraph is particularly addressed, know how the shadow of suspicion withers and torments them. This shadow it is necessary to avoid at all hazards, and on that account to submit to all the requirements of propriety. Young married ladies are at liberty to visit by themselves their acquaintances, but they cannot present themselves in public without their husband or an aged lady. They are at liberty, however, to walk with young married ladies or unmarried ones, while the latter should never walk alone with their companions. Neither should they show themselves except with a gentleman of their family, and then he should be a near relation or of respectable age. Except in certain provincial towns, where there is a great strictness in behavior, young married ladies receive the visits of gentlemen. They permit their company and promenades, without suffering the least injury to their reputation, provided it is always with men of good morals, and that they take care to avoid every appearance of coquetry. Young widows have equal liberty with married ladies. A lady ought not to present herself alone in a library or a museum unless she goes there to study or work as an artist. A lady ought to have a modest and measured gait. Too great hurry injures the grace which ought to characterize her. She should not turn her head on one side and the other, especially in large towns, where this bad habit seems to be an invitation to the impertinent. If such persons address her in any flattering or insignificant terms, she should take good care not to answer them a word. If they persist, she should tell them in a brief and firm, though polite tone, that she desires to be left to herself. If a man follow her in silence, she should pretend not to perceive him, and at the same time hasten a little her step. Towards the close of the day, a young lady would conduct herself in an unbecoming manner if she should go alone, and if she passes the evening with any one, she ought to see that a domestic comes to accompany her, if not, to request the person whom she is visiting to allow someone to do so. But however much this may be considered proper, and consequently an obligation, a married lady well educated will disregard it if circumstances prevent her being able, without trouble, to find a conductor. If the master of the house wishes to accompany you himself, you must excuse yourself politely from giving him so much trouble, but finish, however, by accepting. On arriving at your house, you should offer him your thanks. In order to avoid these two inconveniences, it will be well to request your husband or some one of your relations to come and wait upon you. You will in this way avoid still another inconvenience. 
in small towns where malice is excited by ignorance and want of something to do, they frequently censure the most innocent acts. It is not uncommon to hear slanderous and silly gossips observe that Madame such a one goes to Madame such a one's for sake of returning with her husband. The seeds of such an imputation once sown quickly come to maturity. The care of the reputation of ladies further demands that they should have a modest deportment, should abstain from forward manners and free speeches. End of Part 1, Chapter 4 Recording by Laurie Arsenault, Maine